I suppose it is about every uh, year around this time that we take some time to talk about uh, the return to school. Uh, as we think about that, I know that the uh, Edgewood School started back this last week. Some other schools in the area start back next week. Those of you who are starting college probably start in a couple of weeks. And there are some dangers, whether it be that you are in grade school, and we have a number of grade schoolers here, uh, junior high or high school, uh, college age, that you're going to have to face uh, as you uh, enter into school. And in fact, really these warnings are good for all of us in the different situations that we encounter in life, but we'd like to focus a little bit on trying to be helpful to those uh, who are returning to school uh, this time of the year. You know, when I was in school, we had some dangers we were warned about. Uh, and I want to talk about some of those physical dangers. We would have uh, fire warnings. They would sound a certain alarm. And it mean, meant that there was a, uh, either a fire or a fire drill. And we were to be prepared for that. And they had the same thing for a tornado warning. Uh, and they had different sirens, and I never did keep them straight. I just followed what everybody else was doing and hopefully didn't go outside in a tornado or uh, something like that. Uh, but you know, now there are some more warnings that my kids have to uh, face that we didn't have. There are safe harbor uh, alarms. There are intruder alarms. And even one that I was asking Hannah this morning that she said they call the scatter alarm. Uh, different warnings because we live in a a time in which we have to be prepared for uh, other kinds of dangers as well. Well, today we'd like to talk about some spiritual dangers that you may encounter at school and, and some difficulties that you may face. Well, let's take a few moments and study from the Word of God uh, some of those and try to be helpful in your approach to those. Uh, as you think about some dangers you may encounter in school, you know, one great danger is uh, as we think about those things, is that you lose your identity. You lose who you are. You know, the scripture that we read a moment ago, twice in that scripture, if you're reading out of the New King James, it says, remember your creator in your youth when you're young. It is a good thing to know who you are and who you serve and whose you are when you're young and middle-aged and older certainly true. But the emphasis there in Ecclesiastes 12 is placed upon when you're young. Let me ask you a question. Those of you who are uh, headed off to college and you're around your college friends, those of you who are in grade school and you're going off to be a part of uh, that classroom or junior or senior high, when you get away from your mom and dad, when you get away from an assembly like this, are you a different person? Now give that some, some honest thought. Are you a different person? Do you talk and act differently? I don't mean just that you've got friends and you're having a good time with them. I mean, do your morals, do, do your, uh, the things that anchor your life, do they change? It's really possible that we can live a dual life. The Bible calls that being a hypocrite. But it's possible that we can live a dual life. That around certain people we behave in a certain kind of way. But then when we get away from them and, and the pressures are on in a different scenario, that we forget who we are. We come here and you say, well, I'm a soldier of Christ. Soldiers of Christ arise. What a great song. We sing other songs. We have prayers. We open up the Word of God. We have Bible class. And maybe you say, well, I'm a Christian. I've obeyed the gospel. I've heard that word, and I believe that Jesus is the Christ. And I've turned away from sin, and I stood before a group of people, and I said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I was baptized and had my sins washed away. And then you go off somewhere else. And you forget who you are. You know, the Bible warns us in very clear terms about the danger of losing our identity, of living a different life, of forgetting who we are, of not remembering the Creator. 
In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, the scripture there says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also loved us, and has given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. He says, don't forget who you are. You're an imitator of God. You're a child of God. You're supposed to be walking in love like Christ did. You're a follower of Christ. We might sometimes have to stop ourselves when we are with our friends and we're kind of lost our way and we've lost our identity and we, we forget who we are and just say, you know what? I belong to Christ. I'm an imitator of God. Would someone who's an imitator of God use that language? Would they behave that way toward those of the opposite sex? I don't know that you sit out in the morning and say, well, uh, I'm going to take off my, my Christian demeanor and I'm going to put on this worldly, uh, unrighteous demeanor. But I think sometimes we just get caught up and we forget who we are. We forget who we serve and whose we are. Uh, look with me at Philippians chapter 2. Paul here is talking to these Christians about their behavior. And he's wanting them to remember who they are and what they shouldn't do. He says there, do all things without complaining and disputing. That you may become blameless and harmless. Children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Paul says, I've preached to you, I've taught you. You know, uh, those of you who headed off to school, your parents, and those who have stood in this pulpit and your Bible class teachers, they have taught you, they have worked to try to instill some really important things in you. Remember who you are. That as you go out into the world, and sometimes it's a dark and dangerous place, spiritually, he calls them here a crooked and perverse generation. You are going to count, encounter things that are dishonest and crooked. And you're going to encounter things that are perverted. In this generation, you should be so different that you're like a light that's shining in the absolute darkness. And people who disregard God's word, you hold fast the word of life. People who are children of Satan, that you're a child of God. There's a great danger in losing your identity, forgetting who you are. I don't think it just is a premeditated thing for most. I think sometimes you just get out and get caught up in the situation. And you need to have the strength to remind yourself, this is not who I am. As we think about dangers that you might encounter at school, you might look at these just like the fire alarm or the tornado drill or the scatter drill or whatever they are. You know there's a danger that your morals will become corrupted. Uh, most of you have been raised in, in a way in which you've been taught uh, from the very foundation there's certain things you just don't do. There's language that is unacceptable. That when you uh, interact I mentioned this before, when you interact with people of the opposite sex, there are clear boundaries that you set of things that are acceptable and things that are not. That you don't lie and allow all of this to be compromised. That when you're, those around you, whether you're in grade school or you're in college, when they're pointing you toward the pornography, 
they find online, or they're inviting you to uh, sample, to try alcohol and drugs, when their language is different than what you've been taught to engage in, you know, you're kind of pulled in different directions. Mom and dad have taught you in a certain way. Again, your Bible classes and the preachers and, and those who have been involved in your life, your grandparents, they have taught you in a certain way, but you're pulled in different directions because your friends are saying, this is fun. This is what we do when we're young. And even within yourself, there are temptations and there are lusts that have to be controlled. And it's possible that as you get around people with different values, that your morals get confused and corrupted. Paul warns about that. He warns adults who lived in a very wicked society that as they went out from among God's people to not be deceived because evil company will corrupt good habits. Some translations there will say evil companions corrupt good morals. You can be influenced by those around you and your values that you've set for yourself. Things that you've said, I, I won't do that. You find yourself doing because of the influence around you. Jesus says this about what kind of people we're to be. He says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. When you're tempted to compromise your integrity, when you're tempted uh, to give in to the temptation that your boyfriend or girlfriend is pushing you toward, when you're tempted to drink and smoke and participate in drugs and pornography, all those things we mentioned, you know, you need to say to yourself, I need to do this, not just you. All of us need to say, I'm better than that. Jesus said that if I'm a follower of his, I'm a light in this world. I shine. And there is a clear distinction between me and those around me. But that can become very difficult as you head off amongst a majority who will not share your values. Would you consider also that there's pressure to conform? You know, there, there's <laughs> pressure to conform in all kinds of ways that aren't necessarily uh, right or wrong, hairstyles. And uh, I looked through uh, the yearbook recently of when I was in high school. You know, all the girls had hair, big hair, 80s hair, my kids call it. But as you look through there, just about, not everybody, but just about everybody had the same hairstyle. Sometimes you might be uh, influenced to do things that later you'd say, that was so ridiculous. Driving through Ellettsville the other day, I saw a boy uh, wearing his pants in a way uh, hanging so low that I just thought someday he's going to realize what he's done and he's going to think how bizarre that was. But there is this pressure to look like everyone else, to sound like everyone else, to act like everyone else. And so we're unwilling to be uh, individual sometimes. There's this pressure that if the fashion says that uh, I ought to wear clothes that are not modest, that are too short or too low or too revealing or just too little, that I want to conform, I want to be like that, I want to go out and buy that, that my language and the phrases that I use, I want to sound like the way other people talk. Sometimes it can become popular 
to show disrespect for authority. And so maybe you go off and then you come back home and you talk to your parents in a way that's not like you would have before. Maybe you treat those within your school who are in positions of authority or the police in a disrespectful way because you just want to conform and fit in and be part of the crowd. You know, there's warnings about that uh, in Scripture as well. When we think about those things, uh, look in Romans chapter 12. After Paul's told them to be these living sacrifices, he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He says, don't conform. Don't let yourself be molded and shaped. Don't be just like everybody else. That's hard. I think that's hard at, at every age. You don't necessarily want to be the one who stands out unless your way of conforming is to stand out, which is sometimes true. It's hard to be different, to stand for things that others reject, for people to think you're weird. But, you know, that's addressed here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. If you look there at the end, the quote from the Old Testament, the conclusion is, Be holy, for I am holy, is what God says. But he says, beginning in that reading, Gird up the loins of your mind. Get your thinking right. Be sober. This is serious business. Rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He says it's obedient children. Not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. There's the pressure to conform. He says don't conform yourself to who you used to be. You be holy people. You be saints. You be people who stand for something. And when you have to be different, you be different. Because you are. You're a child of God. He says they're as obedient children. Another danger you might encounter, or will encounter, is compromise. Now, you may say, well, haven't you already talked about a lot of that? I, I have. But you know, sometimes it's not that we go to school and we entirely lose our identity. We, we hold on to some of it. Maybe when we're with certain friends, it's easier because maybe they have some religious training in their life. And it's not that every bit of our morals is uh, down the tubes. It's not that we're conforming in every way, but we make little changes. Not total rejection, but just getting as close as possible. Do you have a spirit of compromise? I'll ask you this. Would you want others that you interact with at the university or the public school would you want them to know that you're a believer in God, a follower of Christ? If you're of an age of accountability that, that you've become a Christian, that you've turned away from sin, or would you find it easier just to kind of hide who you are? The Bible warns us about that kind of compromise. I was thinking about Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 29. Uh, this is just before Jesus teaches about the Good Samaritan. You remember that man who stopped and helped the man on the road while the religious leaders passed by. And it says there, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he said, 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus goes on to teach about the Good Samaritan. What room is there in the word all for compromise? We sing a song sometimes that uh, says, it begins saying, all of self and none of thee. And it ends, none of self and all of thee. How much of you belongs to Christ in your behavior? And, and maybe we expand this a little bit. When you're on the job, when you're with your friends at community organizations, when you're with people who maybe aren't Christians but are friends in this life, how much of you belongs to God? The great commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. The things you love, the things that really make who you are with your inner strength that you have and with the things you think about. Well, there's just no room for compromise there. There's no room to give in a little bit. Just a practical warning here. When you give in a little bit, others will see that. And they'll come to expect that you're willing to give in a little bit. I had a conversation recently about some of the honors programs that they have at school. And a uh, young person went to someone who's in charge of that and said, uh, we have several of our schoolmates who can't make it when you have those on Wednesday night like you usually do. And they would like to be honored for their honors. I suspect that if you give in a little bit, they'll come to expect it. If you say, well, I, I'll wear this immodest outfit, I will give up attending a, a service here and there, and your friends, if I will participate in filthy language or immoral behavior a little, they'll come to expect that as the standard in your life. You remember Joshua back in the Old Testament, verse 14. He's dealing with people who want to go and uh, worship other gods sometimes. He says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. They didn't give up worshiping God altogether. They just added in some idol worship. They were kind of split. He says, put away your gods. Put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were on the other side of the river, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I read that, and I'm so proud of Joshua when I read that. This man, this leader, I think that had to be really hard for him to say, you do what you have to do. You do what you think is right. If that's what you think you're going to do, well, okay. But I'm not going to do like everybody else. And I'm not going to give in even a little. I'm going to serve the Lord. One more. There might be those, even in positions of authority and teaching, who will try to stir up doubt in you. They might ridicule your faith. They might, uh, as you are in a, a class in high school or in college or even in grade school, they might 
view religion as just superstitious. Uh, in children that, in times past that we've provided care for, we've encountered this in the school, who taught certain theories, the theory of evolution as fact, and that any other answer than what they gave was wrong, and would be counted wrong, even to the point if you would say, this theory says, no, that wasn't good enough. They wanted to accept it as fact. To trust in the wisdom of men, to trust in uh, some men's view of science over what the scriptures say. It may not be easy to say, well, I just believe that God created all these things. And I believe that God is in control. And I believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. Well, men have some ways that seem very right to them today, but the scripture says there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Are you going to listen to what God says or what men say? Uh, you may have some very trustworthy teachers in so many ways. But who can you trust more? I thought about Hebrews 4 and verse 12 where it tells us what the Word of God is. It says the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing through the vision of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God is more powerful than the Word of men. And it's more powerful than the textbook. Here's a great passage to live by in all things. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. If someone teaches you something the Lord doesn't teach, reject the man's idea and trust in the Lord. Don't lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge him. There are undoubtedly uh, some very serious dangers that you'll encounter at school. And you ought to take those dangers seriously. When they uh, sound the fire alarm, realize there could be a fire. And when they sound the tornado alarm, make sure that you're in. safe place. If they sound an alarm indicating there's some danger like an intruder in your school, listen to that. Pay attention to that. Be safe. But here are some dangers that maybe you didn't think about. That you go to school and forget who you are and your morals get distorted and corrupted and you're pressured to conform them and, and to compromise to be like everybody else or at least a little like everybody else and that your faith could be shaken if you're not grounded. Be ready to face those dangers. Early in this lesson, I talked to you about what it means to be a Christian. If you need to turn away from sin and be baptized into Christ, we're ready to help you. If you're a child of God who's turned away and you have forgotten who you are, we're ready to help you so that you can stand right before God. There is not a reason for any person to leave here this morning unprepared to meet God. We're ready to help you do that as we'll stand and we'll sing the song.